Today's topic will be technical and social debt. You have already seen what are bad smells and also what is refactoring. And actually, technical debt is quite related to these different notions that you have seen in previous lectures. The term technical debt comes, in fact, from the notion of financial debt that I hope none of you have already had experience with. Uh, basically, if we take the definition of financial debt, it is any amount of money owned to some individual or to some bank and uh, you acquire debt whenever you have to borrow money from someone. And if you are borrowing money, of course, you will have to also return the money with a certain interest. And since this interest is typically a compound interest, it will accumulate of time and the money you will have to uh, give back will become bigger and bigger over time. The consequences of having financial debt is, of course, uh, dangerous because if you keep on borrowing money and you never return the money, after some time, you have to return that much amount of money that you will never be able to repay the debt. And in that case, you may go bankrupt. Now, the idea of technical debt in software is to try to take this analogy with financial debt and to try to apply this in the context of software development. So basically, the definition of technical debt in software is the following one. Uh, basically, whenever you're developing software, you might make wrong design decisions or non-optimal design decisions. And because of this, the quality of your software is not optimal and it will become harder and harder to make changes in your software. And this notion is known as technical debt. If you make sure that your software is of higher quality, it will be easier to make changes. Now, the notion of technical debt in software also means that it is possible to repay your debt. For example, you can apply refactorings or introduce design patterns to increase the quality of your software and in this way reduce the technical debt and make it easier to evolve your software. Just like is the case for financial debt, it's really dangerous not to pay back your technical debt from time to time because if you don't do it, uh, your software will turn into a legacy system bad design choices and bad quality problems will continue to accumulate until they reach uh, such a high level that your software cannot properly be maintained any longer and will need to be abandoned. The notion of technical debt was actually introduced for the first time by uh, Ward Cunningham in 1992. Ward Cunningham is a well-known person in the community of agile software development and basically he terms this definition as a concept in programming that reflects the extra development work that would arise when you try to hack in some short-term solutions in your code instead of applying the best overall solution that might require more time but that uh, after, uh, after some time will uh, be a better solution overall. Typically, the way in which technical debt is measured is in terms of time. For example, here in this picture, which is actually a screenshot taken from the SonarCube tool, it has a plugin for measuring the technical debt. And we see that for a given system, the technical debt has been computed as 95 days. So basically, the technical debt is measured as a notion of time. It would take 95 days in order to resolve all the issues that are found in the software. So here on the left hand side, you see in this particular software product, 1,370 issues of different criticalities have been found and the total time to reduce the technical debt would take 95 days for the moment. If you wait uh, a bit longer, there might be new and more issues and your technical debt will continue to increase over time. So in this presentation, I will focus on a number of questions. The first question I have already addressed, what constitutes technical debt? The second one is, uh, how does it come that technical debt tends to accumulate over time? What are the main causes of technical debt? How can we manage technical debt? What are the main different types of technical debt? And how can we relate them to notions of bad software design and bad software quality, such as bad smells that we have already seen in the previous course. So depending on the source of information that you take, for example, here we have this well-known book about managing technical debt, which is a subtitle of the book Refactoring for Software Design Smells. In that particular book, uh, the authors focus on four different notions of technical debt, which are debt of the source codes, design debt, testing debt, and documentation debt. 
So essentially, they focus on four different aspects or four different types of uh, software artifacts, the source code itself, the design of your source code, for example, uh, which could be UML documents or it could be the overall structure of your code or architecture, the test code, and of course, the documentation. Each of these notions of technical depth can be measured using appropriate tools and techniques. For example, if you want to measure code depth, we should use static or dynamic code analysis tools that allow us to detect bad smells, problems in coding style, and violations of code quality. So tools like PMD, find bugs, and so on. Uh, design depths are similar, except they are, uh, are found at a slightly higher level. For example, non-respect or non-usage of uh, appropriate design patterns, violations of well-known object-oriented or other design principles, and so on. Test depth uh, is everything related to uh, testing. So for example, we might not have enough tests. The quality of our tests is inadequate. The tests do not sufficiently cover the software or the tests are improperly designed. And then finally, documentation depth is everything related to documentation. For example, we might have poor or totally absent documentation. The documentation might be outdated, so it might not be up to date with the current uh, version of the code or there might be other issues in documentation. It's important to note that technical depth is different from software defects. Basically, software defects, or more commonly known as bugs, are things that are actually problematic when you run the software. Your software may not work properly or may even crash uh, because of the presence of bugs. So they are clearly visible to the end user of the software. It's different for technical depth in the sense that this more refers to problems that are only visible for the developer or the maintainer of the software. The end user will not really see that there is some problem with technical depth. It's simply that for the software maintainers or developers, the software will become more difficult to maintain and hence it will be harder to make more changes to the code. Nevertheless, there is some relation between software defects and technical depth because if you have a software that has a higher technical depth, then it is also more likely for software de defects to become introduced because the software code is of lower quality and hence, since it's more difficult to maintain the code, it's more likely that you will make mistakes when you want to add or make changes to this existing code base. Typically, when you as a developer are confronted with badly designed software, then it is very tempting to make quick hacks in the software to make uh, the change that you need rather than finding a proper solution, simply because the quality of your code is not high enough and it will be take you much less time and effort to implement a quick hack rather than uh, properly implementing a well-designed and high-quality solution. So the worse your quality of your software is, the worse it will become over time uh, because it's at some point the only thing you can do to continue making changes to your software is to uh, keep on adding quick hacks. This is a well-known property of any software system, as I have already explained to you when I uh, explained uh, the famous laws of software evolution of Manny Lehmann. Uh, in particular, uh, his law of increasing complexity already told us that if we have a software product that we are going to continually change, then its complexity will continue to increase unless conscious and active effort is done to maintain or reduce uh, this complexity, for example, by applying proper refactoring techniques. So now, what are the main causes of technical depth? Uh, one of the causes would be that the developers are confronted with deadline pressure. If you know that you have to deliver a new release of your software within a week, then you would like to get your software out of the door as soon as possible. And because of this, you don't have the time to make good, well-quality solutions. And because of this, you quickly make suboptimal changes and, for example, you make copy-paste reuse or other quick hacks in your software. Uh, another reason might be that the company or team in which you are involved doesn't have the right good skilled designers. So maybe they don't have enough programming experience or they don't know about proper software design principles. And of course, if software developers don't know how to properly write good quality code, you will never be able to have good quality code. Another important reason is, well, if you don't know anything about design smells, about refactoring, about design patterns, and about 
the good design principles, then you will never be able to apply them in practice. So it's important to learn about all of these features to try to come to a high quality code. And then a final reason of having technical depth is basically even assuming that you have good designers, you don't have deadline pressures, and you are aware of the good practices. If you are lacking the right tools for putting them into practice, then it will be quite difficult to still reduce or avoid uh, technical depth. So we need refactoring tools, we need tools for detecting bad smells, we need tools for analyzing quality, and without such proper tools, it is quite difficult to reduce your technical depth. Now, knowing that technical depth is present and is important, how could we actually manage technical depth? Well, first of all, it's still quite frequently the case that in many software development teams or companies, the managers don't know even what technical depth is. So the first thing we have to do is increase awareness of this notion of technical depth. Secondly, to be able to know where the problem situates itself, we have to detect occurrences of technical depth in our software product. And we also have to be able to determine the impact of such technical depth. So for this, of course, preferably we need tool supports, but we could also already start by doing such uh, things manually. If we have seen that technical depth is a problem and is present in our code base, then we should prepare a recovery plan to try to reduce technical depth. And another thing we can do in parallel is whenever we are developing software, all the time we should be monitoring and controlling the technical depth to try to keep it as uh, minimal as possible to prevent it from accumulating over time. So the more we reduce technical depth at the minimum, the less we will have to repay for our debt later on. You probably know SonarCube. It's a well-known online tool for detecting quality problems. In one of the earlier versions of the SonarCube documentation, they try to link technical depth with what they call the seven deadly sins in your source code, which are listed here below. The first one is the problem of code duplication, then the problem of having either bugs or potential bugs, breaches of coding standards, lack of unit tests, problems with code complexity, spaghetti code, and problems with uh, code comments. So let me go over each of these in the next series of slides. So for example, uh, code duplication, it's always good to reduce technical depth by looking for duplicated code and by trying to reduce this duplicated code. So in this example, the tool has detected a rather limited amount of code duplication only 0.9% in a limited number of uh, 60 files. Of course, you can drill down more in depth to find out where exactly the code duplication is present. And then basically like in any code duplication tools, you will be able to find out which files have code duplication, and then you can try to reduce duplicated code to reduce your technical depth. Another deadly sin they mentioned is, uh, well, in, in this case, I have mentioned uh, two of them together. The problem of having potential bugs that may manifest themselves as bugs in the future and breaches of coding conventions or naming standards and uh, things like that. So these are the typical things that can be detected by static code analysis tools like PMD, like SonarCube, like FineBugs. Another deadly sin is the lack of unit tests. The presence of unit tests can easily be detected using code coverage analysis tools. So for example, here we see that the code is quite highly covered by tests, uh, 70%. Okay, it could still be improved since there is uh, still 30% to go. We can also see that all the unit tests that have been implemented uh, have uh, succeeded. So there's 100% of unit test success. We can even see that for the new code, so basically the code that has been added with respect to the previous release, that there is uh, more coverage on the new code than there is on the total code base. So this is also important to see whenever you add new code, you should strive to increase the number of uh, unit tests to reduce this lack of unit tests depth. Complexity is also a problem. So we have the law of increasing complexity. So it's always a good idea to keep your complexity levels at a minimum. So here, for example, you can use this using well-known metrics such as the cyclomatic complexity metric, which can be computed either at met method level or at class level or file level. So the example we see here is pretty much okay since most of the methods have a low complexity of one, two, 
and there's only very few me methods with a high complexity. Spaghetti design is also a problem. Basically, the spaghetti design is related to the principle of having high coupling and low cohesion and the absence of cyclic dependencies. So again, here to measure this notion of technical depth, we can use a typical coupling, cohesion and dependency metrics that I have already explained in the software evolution course related to software metrics. And then we can use tools like, for example, a dependency metrics to find out if there is a presence of uh, cyclic dependencies in your code. And if this is the case, you should try to reduce these cyclic dependencies. And then the final deadly sin that was listed was the presence of comments. Well, basically there can be uh, two spells. Either the code may be not commented at all, or the other side of the spectrum we might have code that has too many comments. So you should find a good balance between having relevant comments, but not too many, and trying to avoid to have comments all over the place, even if they are uh, irrelevant. Of course, it's also the documentation, which can be either the developer documentation and the end user documentation that should be properly defined that should and it should be consistent with the code. Unfortunately, in many cases, uh, many libraries, software libraries that I have used, they are really poor in documentation, so it is quite difficult to try to use them because the documentation is either misleading or not sufficient to understand what's going on. Related to this notion of technical depth, there is also a methodology that is proposed, which is called the SCALE methodology, which is a shortcut or an acronym for Software Quality Assessment Based on Lifecycle Acceptations. It's typically a method that allows you to put in place mechanisms to reduce the technical depth. The idea that this methodology proposes is the notion of a technical depth pyramid. Basically, they subdivide the notion of technical depth according to different quality characteristics, like reusability, portability, maintainability, security, efficiency, and so on. And for each of them, you have tools that allow us to detect the technical depth. For example, we have a technical depth of uh, 69 days because of maintainability problems, 30 minutes because of probably one security problem, and so on. And the sum of all of these technical depths in total gives you the total technical depth of your system. The advantage of such a pyramid is that you can quickly at a glance see which are the most important characteristics of technical depth that should be looked at. In this case, we see that it's maintainability, that it's a big problem. And the second one is changeability. So if you want to reduce technical depth, it's probably most cost effective to focus all first on these two characteristics of technical depth, and then only later we could you can look at the others. An advantage of this SQL method is that we can also use it to compare technical depth between different projects, perhaps because we want to compare whether we are better than competing companies, or because in the project portfolio of all projects being developed in a given company, all projects are satisfactory with respect to their technical depth. And to do this, the square methodology computes what they call a technical depth ratio, which is uh, defined as the ratio between the actual technical depth in the software measured in days and the effort it would take to rewrite your entire source code base from scratch. So if your technical depth is like 100% or even higher, in that case, it's not worth it to reduce your technical depth. You should better throw away completely your software and rewrite it completely. If you have low technical depth ratios, then everything is okay and you can try to reduce your technical depth. So based on this, they compute a rating which goes from A to E. A is the best rating. So if you have a very low technical depth ratio, then you get an A rating with higher uh, ratios of technical depth, you can you will get a worse uh, scale rating. So now let's go to the second part of today's lecture, which is social depth. Social depth is uh, basically the social counterpart of technical depth. And let me start illustrating this by means of a number of examples and case studies. So first one is the case study of something that happened in the bug handling activity for the Gentoo Linux community. Gentoo Linux is one of the Linux operating systems. And in that case, what these authors, uh, Zanetti et al, uh, reported on, they did some 
research on this ecosystem over time. And they observed using social network analysis techniques, they uh, computed the social network graph of everyone involved in bug handling and how these persons were collaborating. And basically this type of social graph, if the nodes are closer together, then this means there is more collaboration and you can see uh, clusters of people collaborating. What we observe here, this is a picture of what happened in October 2004. This is a picture of what happened in July 2006. But we see that over time, there, there tends to be a clustering and a concentration of activity around a single person. So here, basically, if you see this circle, there is one point in the middle, which is basically one person around which everyone seems to be evolving. Apparently, after some time in this community, all bug handling gradually became concentrated in a single contributor. And actually what happened next was that this contributor obtained so much workload that he suddenly left the project because he was dissatisfied with what was happening. And as a result, after this, it took years for the community to come back to a normal level of performance with respect to bug handling. So this uh, departure of a key contributor in the bug handling activity of Gentoo led to a long lasting negative impact on their productivity and performance. It's a type of social debt because it's a social characteristic, namely a person leaving the community that can have dramatic consequences. Another way to explain this example is what is well known as the so-called bus factor or truck factor. Why is it called bus factor? Suppose that the key developers are hit by a bus, then they are no longer available. And because of this, the project will be much harder to maintain. Uh, in the case of a developer, maybe because this key developer was the person that knew everything about the code and he takes his knowledge with him if he leaves then the project might run into trouble because if this developer is the only one that knows everything about the source code and his knowledge is not shared with anyone else, then it will be quite painful and quite difficult to keep on maintaining that project. So you should always, as a solution to this bad smell, try to avoid concentrating too much of activity in too few persons to avoid having this bus factor problem. Another good thing is to have good level of social diversity within your team. Social diversity can be measured in different ways. One way is uh, in terms of gender diversity. So it's always a good thing to have a good diversity in your team in terms of female and male persons working in your project. In programming in general, it is unfortunately quite difficult because it's well known that women are underrepresented in programming and in software development in general. The exact numbers differ depending on the source, but in industry, uh, some sources say that between 16 to 80 percent of all developers are female. In open source, it seems to be less, only around 10 percent of all developers working in open source are female. And then in social coding platforms like GitHub, Stack Overflow and so on, it's even less, 9 percent or 7 percent. So this is uh, really a problem, well, because uh, there is uh, these guys, Vagilescu et al, have studied the effect of gender and tenure diversity in GitHub teams. So gender diversity is basically the proportion of male versus female in a team. Tenure diversity is more linked to the seniority. So you should have also a good mix between uh, junior people and senior people in your team. Their goal was to measure the effect of such diversity on the productivity of teams. And here is the results they uh, found. If you want to have all details, you can read their paper. But what they showed was these notions of gender diversity and tenure diversity, they have positive uh, effects on the productivity of your team. So if your team is more balanced in terms of gender and in terms of seniority, you will have more productive teams. So having more diverse teams is definitely beneficial. Relating now back to the notion of technical debt, there's a researcher, uh, Damian Tamburi, who made a PhD thesis and several articles on the notion of social debt. And what he tried to do is look in existing software engineering projects developed in industry 
to look for cases in which social problems lead to problems in the software development process. He defines the notion of social debt as unforeseen project cost connected to suboptimal organizational or social structures. And he lists uh, quite a number of different types of social debt, which he calls community smells. So for example, the first one you can see in this list is called organizational silos. This uh, means that your team will be subdivided into several separate teams. For example, you might have the development team, then next to this you might have the database team, maybe next to this you have the testing teams. If all of these teams work in isolated silos and there is really poor communication between these different teams, then this will have a negative impact on the performance and the quality of your project. Other examples are prima donnas. So often in a team you might have persons that have some kind of egotistical behavior. So they are not listening to other persons, they are stubborn and they are really unreceptive to collaboration. If this happens, this can have a negative impact on the team as a whole. And as a result, your team will be performing in a suboptimal way. Another social or community smell will, is what is called organizational skirmish. This means that the organizational structure or culture is not well aligned with uh, the way in which your software development team is being structured. And because of this misalignment, you cannot work as efficiently as you should.